Hello and welcome to another episode of the Spark Hub podcast. My name is Alan and in this episode I speak with Morris Wheeler from We Are Family. Now Morris uh, is a bit of a wizard, he's a bit of a marketing guy, um, but he has a lot of insight into family. In fact, it's, it's his niche. And so one of the places I started with Morris was to talk about the metaverse. So what, what happens when the world goes online? It's been uh, long in the tooth, long in the making. I certainly am uh, very digitally enabled, but what happens when reality and the metaverse almost mirror each other? What do we do with kids on screens? Are there, are there any threats? Are there advantages, opportunities? That's the nature of the discussion with Morris. And we go deep on a few things and uh, not to give away too much of the ending, but I come away a little more heartened with the opportunities versus the threats, but we get into all of that. So without further ado, here's Morris, but just a quick note, as always, there's, uh, if you'd like what you hear, dive into more in the show notes below. And now, enjoy our discussion about the metaverse with Morris Wheeler. So Morris, thanks for uh, coming on the Spark Hub podcast. As is tradition, let's open with a quote, one of your favorite quotes. Uh, so it's actually not going to be someone famous, if that's all right. It's going to be uh, an old um, coach of mine or mentor of mine who always used to say, how are you choosing to feel today? Um, and I particularly liked it because it was always about putting the responsibility of your emotions on you and and uh, and not trying to blame everybody else for why you might be having a bad day and ultimately saying that you're in charge of your own emotions. So whenever, rather than saying, hey, how are you doing today? He'd say, how are you choosing to feel today? So uh, that is Mike Pegg, um, who was the old coach uh, who used to say that. So that's one of the quotes I often kind of refer back to if I'm having a bad day. It's like, okay, well, this is a choice. <laughs> this is a choice. That is a great quote, and don't worry, it doesn't need to be anyone famous. It's a quote <laughs> you choose, uh, and I think I think it's very meaningful to our discussion. So I think, um, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a parent. You're a parent, and I'm scared of some of the stuff I'm seeing. But before I ask you sort of the big questions on the metaverse, I'd love you to give us a, a snapshot of what you do. Originally, right back in the day, I started out as a digital marketeer, and my um, my kind of job and my career path, I guess, evolved over the years. Um, into a much more of a strategic role, which ultimately ended up in a much more of a research role. Um, if, if, uh, if I may, I say that I just got further and further up the tree, um, but some people might disagree with that. But uh, yeah, ultimately started out in the world of marketing, very much kind of went into the world of research, um, but um, into the world of strategy, sorry, but the world of research then kind of naturally falls out the back of that. You can't define a strategy unless you properly truly know and understand your audience um, and specifically kids and families so that was probably an area that I niched into for want of a better word um, probably something like 15 odd years ago um, when Disney was one of our major clients and uh, we were doing a lot of work for them and we realized quite quickly that we really needed to be a specialist in the kids and family audience if we were going to continue to be a valuable partner to Disney. So uh, that's an area that I kind of took on myself to, 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 to grow my own knowledge and an area of expertise. So um, yeah, got into the strategy space with kids and families. And then probably for the last five, six years has been very much still focused very much in that kind of research strategy area and still am today. Um, the company that I run today is a, a broad spectrum marketing agency from your classic research and strategy at the beginning all the way through to the execution and delivery at the end um, but my role within that organization um, and the job that i that i play in the uk so um as, as uk ceo one of our main responsibilities is looking after the bigger international uh, research and strategy for our global clients so that's uh, kind of where i where i sit alongside looking after the whole of the uk delivery so you're a man in the know about families that's for sure and I, 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 uh, I, I guess you get to see all the trends. And if I were to put myself in the shoes of a big brand, um, a guy like you is helpful because you, I guess you bring the connection between the pester power of the children, the structure of families, be they modern or changing, and then where ultimately money goes. So it's a very useful skill set. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Although if I may uh, quote another quote um, so early on in the, in the conversation, um, you know, as Aristotle once said, the more I know, the more I know, I don't know. Um, so, 
you know, particularly within the space of kids and families, which what, what makes it most exciting is that, um, as you say, every day I do more and more research, I realise I know less and less. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, hopefully we'll both be on this journey of discovery together. Well, let me start with one of your former clients. There's a movie out, and it's been out for a while, called Wally. And in this film, we see a future state of humanity where everyone's sitting on a floating chair, punching a screen, sort of disconnected from the natural world, floating in space, content but happy, uh, and it looks horrible. However, as my 10-year-old wakes up every morning, he's binging YouTube, not necessarily bad YouTube, but, you know, great videos. He's coming in with concepts that Elon Musk has planted in his head, and he's told me without, with, with great certainty he's never going to need a driver's license. And what is more, all the boring jobs will be taken care of robots. Something I remember seeing uh, referred to in the 60s when robots were going to do all our dumb, our dumb jobs for us so we could focus on our leisure. So I have a big fear uh, that the future generation could head towards the Wally human. And part of that is what I'm hearing about the metaverse. So it's, it's taking people out of reality, putting them into a virtual reality, which you can scale vertically and horizontally in many directions, be it real estate or otherwise. And I don't know anything about it. My kids can go as far as Minecraft and YouTube, but it seems to me that there's uh, big marketing dollars coming for them in the metaverse. And so I'd love you to tell me a little bit more what is the metaverse as you understand it as conceptually, and then what are the things that I suppose parents need to, to think about so that we don't all end up in a Wally scenario if we can help it. To answer your first question of what is the metaverse, I, th I think the... Um... The metaverse is ultimately, I guess, probably an easy way to think about it is it is it's a, I don't know if this is an easy way to think about it, but it's a, vir it's a virtual universe that runs parallel to the one that we exist in. So let me try and explain that a little more succinctly. You know, you, you and I are both um, long in tooth and grey of hair, so we probably remember things like um, Second Life, for example, which was a kind of a virtual world, and it's and the idea is, is it's always going. So that it's it's always happening. It's always existing. You can jump into it and you can kind of uh, engage with that world and you can come out again. But when you leave, it continues to go. So it's like a kind of parallel, a kind of a parallel virtual universe, if you like. That's that in some respects, that is the metaverse. And the metaverse is a parallel universe. That's a digital universe that's always going that you jump in and jump into and jump out of. Um, and it's kind of omnipresent and, and always going. And there's quite a few metaverses as such, which is actually, and I'll kind of circle back to this in a minute, but if you think about things like Grand Theft Auto Online, you could possibly argue something like the old World of Warcraft type games, um, or there's, um, or even some things like there's some Minecraft servers which haven't really stopped going and they're always still going. Um, and these are all, again, opportunities for you as a, child or isn't anyone to kind of jump in and engage with the world and then kind of jump back out again but the kind of concept but that's been around forever um but the thing that people are getting excited about at the moment or the, the kind of the metaverse buzzword and, and and how it's different from from second life circa 20 odd maybe more 20 odd years ago this web 3 I don't know if you've kind of come across this but the uh, it's it's a kind of a one step further than just the kind of straightforward metaverse so where you've got a grand theft auto and you've also got at the same time you've got like a maybe a, 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 an always going fortnight universe the idea behind web3 is that web3 sits above all of them and enables you to take something that you've earned maybe money that you've earned in the grand theft auto world and spend that in the fortnight world so it's kind of like basically almost joining together all of the metaverses so that you can seamlessly take assets or money or status or objects that you earn in one world and you can take them somewhere else. So you could, uh, a, a kind of a, a terrible example might be you buy a, a nice pair of Nike trainers in, in the Fortnite world and then when you log into the Fortnite world, your, your Nike trainers automatically appear on your avatar and then when you log into the Grand Theft Auto world, 
those same like trainers you can then have on your um, Grand Theft Auto profile as well. So that's the kind of idea behind the metaverse. You can take things with you, but taking things with you is when we start then going into things like blockchain and NFTs and some of that slightly more harder to explain and harder to understand concepts. But that's the kind of the general gist behind the metaverse is it's a it's a it's an opportunity to live a parallel life but in a digital world. I guess you've seen Ready Player One. That's the very much the kind of um, the, the metaverse. I've also seen Black Mirror <laughs> and other shows <laughs> yeah. like, but but I suppose where I mean that that's a really good um, conceptual explanation. So for call it you know the the people that don't get it, it's the aggregation of all the online worlds. So it'd be like all the nations of the world coming together uh, in the real world and having say one currency, as you say, or, or or sort of you know blending everything together. And that all makes sense and it's exciting, as you say. But I also wonder how do I relate to someone who's about to enter that world and how the other thing I've heard about the metaverse beyond that is it can become better than reality. So within five to 10 years, even it's not out of the, uh, it's not out of the realm of possibility that the metaverse could become better than the real world. So if I'm losing an hour of my son's attention span to say YouTube today, how many hours would he be lost say in the metaverse? And I suppose that's, uh, the worry that I have, because I grew up as a gamer, just for background. I played all the games you mentioned. I used to lose myself in, um, you know, all kinds of games that were 3D scrollers or 3D um, navigation games, but I also was outside a lot. So I kind of had the real world and the parallel universe, as you say, running next to me, but I was able to adapt. It feels today uh, like the metaverse might actually cannibalize at the real world. And I don't know what your feelings on that are, but there's a lot of patterns. I'm, ass- I'm assuming a lot of your brands, for example, are starting to invest in the metaverse in some meaningful way. So is there a concern alongside the opportunity, I guess, for the kids of tomorrow? I don't know. I mean, so interestingly, so we just did a big bunch of research with Gen Z, which is, um, or Gen Z, as we should say, uh, this side of the pond, which is uh, 16 to 24 year olds. And when we were talking to them about um, connecting with friends um, and um, how they like to be connected, they're an extraordinarily connected generation. They are probably far more social than I ever was as, at that age, you know, particularly at the younger end of that age when I was 16. Obviously, again, uh, grey of hair, didn't have mobile phones, didn't have digital connection with my mates. You know, basically when we left school, that was it. You know, I might phone a mate in the evening, but rarely. Um, so actually, you know, they are ultra connected with their with their friendship groups through mobile phone, through WhatsApp, through Snapchat, through Insta, through whatever it may be. And so they are an extraordinarily connected generation, and they don't see really, they don't see much of a difference between uh, a conversation on the phone, a conversation via WhatsApp, a conversation you know, in uh, on a Discord server when they're playing a video game, a conversation through the video game itself. They, the, the, it's just communication to them. It's just socializing with their mates to them, whether they're doing it in person, whether they're doing it digitally. They prefer in-person socializing. So it's not like they're, they're becoming these wally-fied, um, you know, couch potatoes that, that don't know how to do real-world physical interactions. That's not true. They actually, given the chance, they would love to meet up, but they're often not given the chance. They're at home, you know, and, and as we know, parents aren't letting their kids out as much as they were when we were kids and blah, 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 and all those things. But they way prefer the physical interaction and kind of hanging out with their mates. You know, when you ask them, what would you like to do? They always want to go and meet up in the park and chill and chat. So that's, you know, that's, I guess, encouraging. But at the same time, you know, the the socialization is socialization, whatever it may be and whatever kind of shape or form it takes. So the question is, I guess for me, is like, well, if we want our children to socialize with their mates, yeah, we'd love them to do it in reality, but ultimately they can't for various reasons. So what's the problem with them socializing with their mates within a digital environment? You know, there's limits to it. And, and you know, we don't want them to be, doing nothing but but socializing dig- digitally you know I'm, I'm by no means I'm, I'm no parenting expert yeah what it what it what it means for parents is it's it's hard for me to answer that question because part of me is quite I'm a very strict parent um and um I'm I'm often the first one to limit my children's um connectivity um but at the same time you know should we fear them chatting with their mates via digital devices or via screens any more than we would if they were doing it 
physically, no, probably not. No, you've answered it well. But there is no answer. It's the short version, and every parent's doing it differently. And just to contrast what you say, I, I had another guest on the show who um, is a teacher, and she's moved around the world teaching in different classrooms. And I asked her a similar question. What In the classroom, what are you seeing with all this new technology coming in? And she said, it's interesting because the kids still have a real desire, most of her kids, to actually draw because they learn that if they can put pen to paper, they remember things better. So like you say, they diversify their mind to say, this is what I can do with digital tools. This is what I can do with analog tools. And as you say, they like to be in person. They like to get together. And they seem to, have, at an early age, seem to recognize the opportunity across every environment. And so that was an interesting thing that she said. And to your point, I know some parents who are uber strict and uber conservative, and they say 30 minutes a day, and we have to watch what you watch, or we have to know what you're watching. And I've spoken to parents who just go, no, I just can't hit the, kid the iPad. When they're bored, they'll go outside and, and bike around for a while. So they, they kind of autopilot themselves. I guess one statistic that I've been reading, and it's more for girls than boys, and I have boys, but for those that have girls, is that the impact of boys gaming and watching YouTube seems to have a much less um, impact in their adulthood than girls that seem to be on Instagram and mobile and are, are sort of entering this filtered world with false senses of beauty and reality. And so I suppose that's where I start to think, yes, there's loads of opportunities. Clearly, kids are recognizing what is good and what is bad. But depending on gender, it can have a, you know, this impact of, say, social media, mobile consumption can actually have a, a radical difference into adulthood. And so I don't know if you've seen the same studies, but have you seen along gender lines specifically um, anything along, you know, anything that worries you or that concerns you about consumption habits specifically around say, social, heading into metaverse-type environments. Just note something that you said earlier, which I thought was quite interesting when you're talking about how digital creativity and, 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 and uh, the, the, the teacher friend of, you's, of yours um, talking about digital creativity. I think that's a really good example, actually, because we did some research into creativity and the power to, of technology to augment and to empower um, creativity. Um, and it's fascinating because it's basically, it kind of, particularly in the world of creativity, it does all the things that we want technology to do. It enables uh, faster learning. It, it kind of empowers and it kind of gamifies and makes um, uh, doing craft and art um, easier to do. It kind of gives a really nice scaffolding, as they would say in the educational world, um, where um, you, know, you, can, you can build and create um, within a kind of fairly rigid structure, which sounds almost the, the antithesis of creativity, but it enables you to create something amazing quite quickly and quite easily, which is quite an empowering and encouraging thing to do, which then encourages them to do more and more and more. So many times, you know, we've seen children who start to draw something, it doesn't look like they want to, they throw it in the bin, they give up and they walk away, whereas what digital enables them to do is do something that, that's kind of creative and, and amazing. And it also opens their horizons and it broadens them to a whole new and exciting array of, of creative endeavours, whether that be creative endeavours through music, through photography, through artwork, through game creation, through coding, many could argue, is a, is a creative endeavour. So Actually, technology there is a, is a beautiful example of how it really is doing what we want technology to do, which is taking the things that we want our kids to learn how to do well um, and making it easier for them, enabling them and empowering them to do that in a more meaningful and impactful way. So when we think about communication, when we think about socialising, that's what we ideally want technology to do. We want it to, to empower the children. We want them to kind of go ah, oh, this is brilliant, this is enabling me to express myself in a way that is meaningful, or it's enabling me to have a conversation with somebody in a way that's meaningful or, or easier or more impactful than, than if technology wasn't there. Um, I think that the, the, the danger is, in some respects, is that actually, whereas something like creativity hasn't been co-opted, I guess, by the commercial world um, to the same degree as communications have, 
you know, and we can squarely, quite squarely point our fingers at our friends at Meta, who have, who have almost certainly co-opted the world of communication for their own financial gains. And, and ultimately, in many respects, gaming the system in order to, to um, make communication between people something that they can ultimately interfere with, manipulate, monetize. And that can't be healthy. Um, we don't see that in creativity. So we see all these wondrous things coming out of the world of kind of, you know, creative endeavors because it's just not commercialized and monetized and therefore, you know, open for manipulation in the same way that communication is. So is there something, you know, the, the kind of question of are we worried about, am I worried about anything that I'm seeing? Um, yes, a lot. Um, and so much is coming from, talking about parenting just got a call from my son bear with me one moment please <laughs> so as, as far as like the things that i'm worried about um again if i look back to that gen z research that i kind of mentioned a second ago what we saw was i guess it's like a this this conflation of situations and scenarios which has driven kind of quite a serious mental health problem within that generation which i can only see coming down younger as such as the the way that all these things go but you've got a, a generation that wants to be permanently connected that are they're ultimately almost socialized to within an inch of their lives as far as like they are constantly trying to communicate and engage with with their their peers and they're ultimately trying to communicate both directly and indirectly you know we all do that kind of one-on-one -on -one communication if I'm chatting with my mates, but we also kind of do the, the broader communication, which is about sharing your lifestyles and sharing your life and virtue signaling and all those kind of various um, bits and pieces. And then what we see is that that, that age range is obviously, the, because communication is so embedded into their digital worlds, that ultimately they're using their digital personas, they're using the ways that they, they express themselves online as a means of connecting with friends. And therefore they the importance that they place in their digital existences is, is very, very high. We also know that that generation um, is prone to, you know, uh, to, to manipulate that. Um, and they are always wanting to try and have a better life than they actually have and to show themselves in a better light than they actually are. And that is then kind of confounding the situation where they then, you know, are ultimately in this kind of slightly hellhole situation where they're just ultimately, they're lying to themselves and to their friends they're really struggling with then that connection because you know they're not getting the feedback on their fake lives that they wanted which makes that they want to fake it even more to try and get even more positive affirmation for the things that they're doing which is kind of leaving them to this almost kind of nightmare scenario where they're just so so the mental load on them is getting too much and we're seeing serious mental health issues in that generation because of this and and other factors but this is definitely one of the the kind of the main um factors is the fact that they are kind of being driven and manipulated to, to socialize in a way that isn't normal but, but i guess the the thing that that slightly encourages me is that you you that's what gen, that's Gen Z, and that's the bubble that's kind of like almost shifting out. And the, and the ones that are coming in, like one of the most popular apps amongst kind of fourteen to seventeen, eighteen year olds, is an app called Be Real. Um, and the idea, I don't know if you've come across Be Real, but the idea behind Be Real is um, at any moment over a twenty four hour period, you set up a little like a little Be Real group, if you like, you and like ten mates, and then Be Real will then message you all at the same time and go take a photo right now front camera back camera on your camera exactly what you're doing now and you've got like a, a certain amount of time to take that photo and the idea is, is just be real don't fake it don't try and make it into something that it's not just take the photo and that's and that generation that's coming up that kind of 14 to 18 year old are actually kind of going you know what i'm not going to play that game that 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 the last generation gen z did so i guess if you've got a kid who's 16 to 20 then you should probably be more concerned potentially than if you've got a kid who's kind of younger than 16 so kind of the 15s 14s because they're just they're just becoming a little bit more savvy in, in many respects they're kind of rejecting the last generation as is yeah. what you do in life um so actually you're they're just fighting a little bit and i don't know I, I always feel hopeful whenever i talk to kids which I do a lot. I always feel hopeful that they're a hell of a lot smarter than we give them credit for. I don't know. I think the kids will be all right, you know. Well, it's interesting you say that because I've said this theory before to a different guest, but 
I always say you could look one of two ways. Either this is going to be a wedge between parents and kids because we don't understand online versus analog primacy, identity primacy. And you can very easily get into that. You know, you and I of a certain generation, we were analog primacy first with an add-on digital primacy in terms of identity. What happens if your whole life is online and then analog doesn't seem as good? So I can see a scenario where people can get sucked into the future metaverse. Facebook is obviously losing customers uh, of, the, of a certain demographic, so they're trying to future-proof. So it's very easy to get into that scenario. But the other scenario I see, the fork in the road, is when I was growing up, smoking and drinking were the grand were the vices of my parents' generation. And so I was, I mean, the number of drink-driving commercials I was subjected to when I was 16, the number of you know, the changes in smoking regulation in terms of putting graphic images on stuff. So I said, well, you know, obviously that's a, a, an effect of the cause, which was my parents' generation, our parents' generation used to get in the car and think nothing of driving after a few drinks or would smoke with their friends without consideration for. So, so I, I look at that and I go, okay, fine. And by the way, when I came up, skiing was popular, but snowboarding was more popular. And then the next gang that came went back to skiing and then another gang came in and they have a different way of going down a slope. And so every generation is rebelling against what came before. Where I'm going with this is the hope for me is, like my kids are already saying, I'm not going to need a driver's license. I'm not, and that kind of makes me sad. But they're also saying, I'm never going to use Facebook. Metaverse, eh, I, I prefer to hang out in the park with my friends. So I do agree that there's this glimmer that the kids are looking at this as mommy and daddy's drug or some other kid's drug and going, yeah, I'm going to avoid that path. Just look now at, at, at the you know, university kids don't drink. Or not that they don't drink, but they drink a lot less than uh, I know. I don't know about your university days, but that was one of the reasons to go. And they're and they're turning into wellness and retreats and yogic practices, all the kind of stuff that you kind of want people to do. So I do agree with you. There's an awareness of 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 the bigger picture, but there I still do worry. There's people that can get sucked in either by by identity, by gender, and they can get sucked into a world where their identity doesn't you know, doesn't play out in the real world the way I want and the mental illness can continue. So it, it can kind of go either way, but what is certain is it's happening at breakneck speed. Everything's it, been it, compressed. Timelines have been compressed. Like you you wouldn't believe, uh, well, you would believe because you know it, but. I think you're right. I think, you know, I think you're right as far as, you know, it's, it's that the, the what, you, you know, what the kids that are coming up these days are doing is in many respects rebelling against things that they see that their parents are doing, you know, and their parents are ultimately the ones that are on Facebook 24 seven. And they're like, I'm not going to be on Facebook 24 seven. So in many respects, yeah, absolutely. They're rebelling against that. There's no answer, Morris. There is no answer. Well, I would be fascinated. I'd be fascinated if you don't mind just to dive in. You answered one of my questions, but around, the gender split. So when you're looking at the impact of technology, be it social, mobile, or potentially projecting to metaverse, do you feel there's a difference between a female mind and a male mind in terms of the danger, I guess, of mental of mental uh, instability or the, or the consumption behavior? Because that's what I read recently, is it can be divided by gender lines. And I'd be fascinated to know what you've witnessed or what kind of what your research is saying along those lines well i mean ultimately gender lines are defined by culture aren't they so you know what's i don't think that obviously there's there's nothing that is a there's no kind of biological differences between the challenges that boys face versus girls face but there is definitely a cultural differences between the challenges that what boys face and what girls face and i think girls are typically there tends to be an expectation that girls are much more sociable um, and they tend to be more than more than boys again there is a there is a perception within culture that girls care more about their social groups and their social standing within groups than boys do whereas boys are a little bit more chill about that sort of thing again i don't think that's a that's not a biological thing it's a cultural thing so you know in many respects girls are coming into a world where there is an expectation that that is the expectation that, that you know that there that there is a belief that culturally this is your job girl you know as a girl you are you know your job is to be worried about these things so naturally they are worried about these things you know again won't get into a big kind of gender debate as such but um i think the challenge is is that there is an expectation that girls are more sociable and they take their social standing um and the way that they communicate um and um is a much more of a you know a social communication versus boys so there is there is that challenge but that's not to say yes the typical girl probably has more 
troubles, um, particularly as far as, you know, obviously social media is particularly um, image heavy um, and um, image in both the way that one expresses oneself is obviously quite a visual uh, by image, but also the image as far as like, you know, the, the how you portray yourself. And I think girls are probably have a higher expectation about having a more in, in inverted commas, perfect image versus um, boys um, who being a bit more rough and ready and a bit more whatever is, is something that is a bit more, you know, culturally acceptable. So again, the pressure to be perfect, I think is higher for girls than it is for boys generally speaking but that said i think generally speaking that you know i think it's quite it's always dangerous isn't it to say therefore boys don't have that challenge because they do 100 percent, they do they, they still have that that challenge i didn't mean to um, imply that boys and girls don't have those i'm just meant generally because as i said when i was listening to uh another psychologist he was splitting it along gender lines and to be clear i'm not talking about biological gender i'm talking about inside or, you know what you yeah social gender as you say, it's culturally driven. Um, so let's remove the biological element for a minute. Uh, people can skew different ways. And so in that context, he brought up the fascinating point that YouTube and games seem to have less impact on the sort of more male males and a uh, bigger impact is on the more female archetype was impacted by the likes of filters and Instagram and fake world, the opposite of be real. So it was a fascinating observation, but where it's leading me is as someone who works with big brands, what type of advice are, you, are, are they coming to you for in terms of, you know, planning uh, marketing spend to target certain people and that sort of thing? I imagine that they would be looking to you to say, you know, how do we invest wisely um, in the metaverse if kids aren't using traditional media and watching TV commercials on Saturday morning like they used to? Uh, and I'm, I'm dating myself by saying that. Where where do you go to to get pester power? Where do you to go to get products in the right environment? It strikes me that if they're all breaking off and decentralizing and blockchaining um, metaverses or otherwise, it's it's going to be a very fragmented landscape for someone who used to be able to target um, by all kinds of different factors. So, I suppose my question to you is: If the metaverse is coming, if all these changes are coming, uh, would I be right in saying brands are starting? to have to think differently about how a product or a service enters into the children's domain or into the pester power domain? Um, I guess I would, I would, first of all, I would challenge a common perception quite a, quite a lot that is that actually people, the words that you're using there are quite negative as far as like pester power, particularly and manipulating and getting in front of and those types of things. And actually, I just genuinely, and I'm not just saying this, I genuinely think that the people that I deal with the clients that I deal with generally are trying to do good um, and they're not actually out there trying to manipulate and persuade children to do things that, that is wrong or, or that, that's kind of even against what they're no one's trying to corrupt the minds of youth in order to, to kind of sell more product to them. There probably are people out there that do that. But generally, my clients, they're all, gen they're all quite nice people. What they are trying to do is create great content that kids really like to watch. I used to love watching great content. A lot of my clients really love making good content that kids want to engage with. Yeah, there needs to be a commercial angle to that. They're not charities. You know, they want to ultimately, you know, if they can, make some additional revenue through the sale of products and, you know, and merchandise or whatever. But, but ultimately, it's not quite, it's never as manipulative as I think lots of people think. I think as soon as they kind of take a step outside of the industry and, and they go, oh, I assume that this is all kind of, evil and nefarious but genuinely that in, in in my world most people in the kids space are actually there for all the right reasons so kind of that you know with, with that in mind when we think about the metaverse ultimately what they're thinking is well this is just another means this is just another saturday morning cartoon um you know whereas kids are sitting down you know again when i was a kid i'd sit down and watch he-man big fan of he-man um i'd love to sit down and watch that i'd love to read my asterisk books i'd love to you know play my video games and what they're now saying is well kids are going into the metaverse and exploring the metaverse let's give them a really cool experience that they can that they can have there what i am hearing most people doing is like well let's create an engaging and exciting experience for kids to engage with as far as like yeah, we you know there are plenty of opportunities to advertise those you know and advertise in them again in the same way that there was you know kids ads on TVs when when I was a kid. There's obviously kids ads in meta in the metaverse or in Roblox you know nowadays. 
um, to make them aware of a new product or to you know make them aware of a new show. It's almost a very, very similar domain as the old ads in comics and ads on TV and you know ads that existed in all the places that we used to, to look at. Well, now kids are looking in the metaverse, and so that's an opportunity to then talk to them about new exciting products that they might want to get involved with. Well, I'm heartened to hear that there's, an, there's, an, uh, there's a, a demand for better content. I also feel that from my perspective, the marketing landscape has changed away from sort of fake commercials and more towards authentic uh, useful content, and, there's, and that's a good thing, I think. But where, where I say pester power is I see it personally, where, for example, my youngest son, who's seven, will be playing an app game, a game he's seen, and he's, while he's playing that game, he gets served an ad for another game, so he's suddenly running to me to get the next app, and then he sees an ad for another app, and suddenly we're chaining apps, and he's jumping between all these different games, and it's, it, it, for me, it's, it is pester power, because every two minutes he's distracted by another app. I don't think it's a bad thing, um, but I do, I do recognize the pester power that I once knew from TV advertising has suddenly morphed. And now I wonder what it's going to be like with a child walking in in a haptic suit with, with VR goggles saying, give me your thumbprint so I can get this, this latest. Uh, who knows? Maybe I'm, I'm projecting too much into the future, but I can imagine it going that way. I'm still, I have always been mega skeptical about that proper full immersive metaverse. I Look, I know that maybe in a hundred years the world's going to be a different place. Ten years, I genuinely don't think it will be that much different to what we see today. I do not think that people are going to want to stick screens on their faces of their children. I think that the you know particularly things like big VR headsets, the amount of money that has been put into those devices for them to be successful, and still, I would argue they are niche at best. Um, you know, and one could quite happily say that they are a total flop at worst, um, or even probably at average, they are a total flop. Again, considering the amount that Meta, Sony, Samsung, they have all stuck so much money into, into that, believing that that's the next thing. I don't even think, you know, people will always say, yeah, it's just give it a little while, technology will be amazing, and then... You know, when you think I've been having that conversation about VR headsets for 20 odd years, I think it's more than just a tech issue. I just think it's a fundamental. We are social beasts. We like living in the real world. Yeah. Again, there's going to be a place in the 50 years time when, you know, the, the technology and devices that we can implant and augment ourselves with will mean that that interaction with that metaverse, with that fake world is just exactly the same as the real world. But that is a long way away. I don't think our children will ever be in haptic suits with VR headsets on. I just don't think that's the case. I've worked on a number of products from, from virtual reality through to augmented reality, through to, you know, the Microsoft Connect, that kind of amazing add-on for the Xbox, which kind of like took the picture. And everybody was like, oh, my God, this is going to change the world. To 3D TVs. To all these things, when actually, after a while, people went, I just don't, people just don't want it. You know what, they're, they're happy to engage with that digital space at the moment through screens. Yeah, that will change. In my opinion, though, that is a long way away. I think that the phone and the TV and the laptop are still going to be king. I can't imagine people are going to be wanting to consume content through VR headsets Um on the same mass scale as they want to consume content um, on TVs. Kids are just not, that's not how they want to engage with content. We do a lot of content testing and 99% of children, when they watch stuff that they want to watch, they just sit there and watch it and they are loving it. And you just think, what on earth does a VR headset give them that they, that they, at what point of a child consuming a piece of content on either a, a laptop, a TV, a mobile phone where they're literally just sitting down loving it at what point do you look at that and you go you know what that kid needs that kid needs something strapped to their face and they want to be running around the room no they don't they just want to sit there chill and watch tv you know yeah okay you could argue that that wasn't the case 50 years ago and you know that they were outside and you know look, look where we are today i just can't see it being something that a children want b parents want or, or C is just going to be something that is, is is a fundamental part of society. I just don't. We're just too 
we're too bonded with real world to want to replace that yet. I, I, I agree and I understand. I think one of the things I've heard, though, is what if it becomes instead of a, you know, let's say it's a fourth device, which is a pair of glasses and a Neuralink that's, you know, burrowed into your brain. So, you've, you know, you you don't really need to go outside your head. But again, I'm starting to get into a space that probably isn't even, even here yet. And to your point, even if it lands in five to ten years, uh, there's no guarantee of adoption. Let's look at let's look at the graveyard of all the things we saw that were going to replace the laptop, replace the mobile, replace everything, and that graveyard is only getting bigger and bigger. So um, we'll see. But what? Yeah, you know. Again, I, I do a lot of research. We speak to. I probably speak to hundreds, if not thousands, of children on an annual basis, and I really appreciate that. You know, me as white middle class you know waspy um person that i am in my in my very very privileged existence can sit here and and, and kind of say i just don't believe that to be the case when i know and i've been in households where i've kind of gone uh that's not you know eek that feels nasty it feels like you know a parent of a six month year old is sticking an ipad in the cot basically to you know like just put the child in you're like oh that's not what i would do <laughs> You know, and I appreciate that there is these kind of extremities of, of parenting, um, and that might those extremities might become more the norm. I think there is a long, long time before parents are going to go, yeah, no, absolutely implant that in my child's brain. Go for it. I've got no issues with that. You know, that is a long way away. You know, again, just think what we were like, you know, even just 10 years ago, that wasn't that long ago in the grand scheme of, not much has changed in 10 years. Yes, you could say that it's gone breakneck speed and there are new apps and there are new blah, blah, blah. But actually, how children are consuming content, it's on different platforms. It's a different mode as far as like maybe it's more much, it's, it's almost entirely video on demand, whereas maybe 10 years ago there was a remnant of linear broadcast. But, you know, and, and now it's almost entirely a video on demand. You know, yes, obviously 10 years ago we didn't have... The, the same prevalence of the Netflixes and the Disney Pluses as we do today from a content um, perception. Yes, 10 years ago, probably children didn't have quite as many screens available to them. To say that in the next 10 years, we're going to be all strapping screens onto our children's faces and implanting stuff in their brains, you know, I think we are 30, 40 years before that's even a reality. Again, I might sound like an old dinosaur and like those people who went, the internet will never take off. But I just, from what I understand of basic human traits and basic kind of anthropological needs, I just struggle to think that that's going to become mainstream. In my lifetime as a marketeer, I can't see that being the case. Maybe in my children's lifetime, maybe in my grandchildren's lifetime as a marketeer, maybe. It's just not something that's really that deep, immersive, screen on face world i think it will all be through the standard screens that we're aware of at least for another 20 years it's a great prediction morris and as you say it's coming back to your quote when you see people and you they lift their eyes from the screen you can ask that question how have you chosen to feel today and i just wonder as if you say is if it's more going to be the, the way content is served the way it's formatted the way it's consumed that seems the ux basically um seems to be where the, the big changes are going to come in the next few years i'd be curious curious to get your opinion on one more item before we we round off and one of the, the items was sort of the cancel culture sort of offense culture and i read a fascinating study that um the other week that was saying what's ha what seems to be happening nowadays especially with uh the younger generation say sub 20 is that they're losing the ability to read body language. So if I'm standing in front of you, you'll very quickly pick up my mood in terms of, is he aggressive, fight or flight? Is he friendly? Whereas we read a tweet, and even if it's got sarcasmism, not everyone can pick that up. And so people are, for example, taking tweets and comments and social, uh, social threads and looking at them as, uh, you know, as threats, as, as if someone's really going to intend them harm. And of course, you then get into cyberbullying. I just wonder what your thoughts are on melding the two worlds of, of reading body language and intent with the devices that serve them in a way that might strip away the way we can interpret intent. And if you've seen anything in that space, be it sort of different ways to display content, different ways to sort of signal that, that someone's not serious or that it's a bot, 
it seems to me that it's almost the spam culture, the offense culture, the cancel culture that is at risk of growing, but it might just be the marginal few that are seeing it and sort of over-representing those statistics. So with that in mind, have you seen anything along those lines in terms of just people getting more offended, but because they can't necessarily distinguish between intent and threat? Well, I don't think, you ask a kid that, I don't think they will say that they've ever had any issue understanding what their mates have said when they've texted them. I think ultimately it's probably old folks like us that are going around going, well, I didn't understand what they said because, oh, they were, they were twi twintogramming me or something. I don't really know. And I think that, you know, you get so many people going, well, oh, the whole kind of body language thing. I think, yes, if you, if you spent the formative years of your life, first 16, 20 years of your life, only engaging with people in a physical sense and ultimately you built up a, a set of heuristics in your mind as far as what what someone meant and how to judge and interpret what someone said through what they're physically doing but i think i think ultimately we still want to communicate and we still want to try and understand and we still want to um proactively make sure that we aren't misinterpreting somebody else and i think the children today who don't necessarily have body language as a means to kind of validate an opinion or to kind of to see what someone's intent is therefore they just don't assume it to intent so they would they would take a, a tweet at its face value and not assume that, that someone is being quite so aggressive they would just kind of go okay you know what i don't know what the intent is here because it's not super clear so i'm not going to make an assumption because that's not going to be helpful for anyone i think those assumptions are coming from stupid old people who back in the day that was the only the only way that they could measure intent was through body language. Whereas I genuinely am not I'm not hearing that from kids. There are very few children that go, I don't understand what my mate said, or I'm or he misinterpreted my message when I sent it to him. Because they know that something is open to misinterpretation, because that is that is the communication that they grew up with. So they are well, well aware of what can be interpreted and what can't be interpreted because that's what they've been doing their entire lives. So I actually think that that in 10 years' time, it won't be a conversation because I think people will go, well, I, I know what can be interpreted by what I wrote because that's how I've been communicating for all of my life. So it's fine. I get it. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I think it's um, it's a small bubble that will disappear as as old folks who grew up with body language as being their sole means of determining intent um, slowly die off. And those that haven't had that as their core means of determining intent um, actually come into play and, and, and actually know how to uh, regulate their opinions based on um, what they see rather than um, making assumptions based on what they don't see. That's fascinating. Well, uh, thank you, Morris, for this has been an illuminating, illuminating conversation. And I've learned a lot and I've I'm sort of have a lot more hope now because, as I say, I've been reading a lot of studies. I've been listening to psychologists talk about the dangers of certain things. But I do feel that um, you can't always project the future and no plan survives contact with the enemy, as we always say. So it's good to know that there's shreds of hope that you're seeing it from the trenches. And uh, I do hope a lot of this stuff trends in the right direction. But uh, no, and just to kind of end, uh, I'll end on a quote, if you like, to kind of round it off so nicely, is there's a good friend of mine called Dr. Jessica Petrowski, who's um, over at the University of Amsterdam, and she always says that the technology is neither good or bad, it is powerful. And I think that's, that's the thing, is that it's not that technology is, is potentially destroying the kids, it's potentially just a very, very powerful means of augmenting what they're doing at the moment. So definitely you shouldn't consider technology to be a, a potential foe because it can be a potential friend just as easily. That's amazing. Well, thank you, Morris. This has been great. I appreciate your time today. Thanks a lot. Not a problem at all. Good to speak to you. Thanks for listening to this episode of our podcast. Uh, if you like what you hear, you can dive into a lot more on thesparkhub.com.